ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय Srimad Bhagavad Gita as it is, translation and commentary by His Divine Grace Sri Lanka Sri Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, founder of Chaitanya School. Chapter 10, text 14. Sarva meta dritang manye yan mang varasike shava nahite bhagavan vyakting vidur deva nadanava ha. O Krishna, I totally accept as truth all that you have told me. Neither the demigods nor the demons, O Lord, can understand your personality. Purport, Arjuna herein confirms that persons of faithless and demoniac nature cannot understand Krishna. He is not known even by the demigods, so what to speak of the so-called scholars of this modern world. By the grace of the Supreme Lord, Arjuna has understood that the Supreme Truth is Krishna and that he is the perfect one. One should therefore follow the path of Arjuna. He received the authority of Bhagavad Gita. As described in the fourth chapter, the parampara system of disciplic succession for the understanding of Bhagavad Gita was lost, and therefore Krishna re-established that disciplic succession with Arjuna, because he considered Arjuna his intimate friend and a great devotee. Therefore, as stated in our introduction to Gita Upanishad, Bhagavad Gita should be understood in the parampara system. When the parampara system was lost, Arjuna was selected to rejuvenate it. The acceptance by Arjuna of all that Krishna says should be emulated, then we can understand the essence of Bhagavad Gita and then only we can understand that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God. Bhagavad Gita is full of uh, important statements relating to uh, spiritual knowledge or that are spiritual knowledge. This verse is one of the important statements, one of the most important statements. Although it's not actually spoken by Krishna, Bhagavad Gita means that which is spoken by Krishna, Bhagavan, Sri Bhagavan Uvacha. Prabhupada points out at the first occurrence of the term Sri Bhagavan Uvacha, Prabhupada points out the significance of Sri Bhagavan Uvacha. This is, this is not anyone speaking, this is Bhagavan, the Supreme Lord, who is actually Bhagavan by his qualities, not just that he's Bhagavan by vote or by declaration, but is actually Bhagavan as is described by Arjuna in the verses previous to this. So therefore, Bhagavad Gita has importance because it's spoken by Bhagavan. Uh, the importance of Bhagavad Gita is also established by the fact that Krishna spoke to Arjuna and the manner of Arjuna's acceptance of it, that because Arjuna is a devotee, uh, he's been able to understand Bhagavad Gita and his manner of Accepting Bhagavad Gita is the manner in which it should be accepted by all other persons. In other words, Krishna is speaking through Arjuna because Arjuna is the uh, ideal hearer of Bhagavad Gita. Bhaktosi me sata chaiti rahasyam here to do tamam. Krishna says, I'm speaking this knowledge to you uh, because you are my devotee as well as my friend. A devotee means one who intrinsically has faith in Krishna. Now, here in this verse, we understand the method of understanding Bhagavad Gita. It's not simply that one studies Sanskrit and then reads and then he can understand. There are many, many persons who are very expert in Sanskrit and who know all the verses of Gita, but who don't understand even one single aksharama of what is in there. They don't understand anything, nothing. They're totally misguided and misled. Especially uh, Bhagavad Gita, we see it's uh, popular with many Advaitavadis also, who, uh, even though Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, his ultimate instruction, Sarvadhaman Pavitya Ma Mekam Sharanam Raja, surrender to me. Somehow, even surrender to me means that surrender to me means there's Krishna, there's the devotee, and there's the act of surrender. But somehow they squash it all into one. So. They may be expert Sanskrit scholars and they may be expert at describing it in various ways and this is this this verb root means this and that and therefore when Krishna says surrender to me it actually means that there is no Krishna and there is no one and it's all one and everything is one and you're also God and 
all kinds of bamboozling, balderdash, they speak. So, uh, Bhagavad Gita is to be understood in the manner that Arjuna understood it. Now, Arjuna says, uh, I, O Keshava, Krishna, I accept as truth everything you have said. Now, this expresses Arjuna's faith. And many people will say this is, faith is not good. We should understand things in a rational and empiric manner. However, faith at some stage, to, to understand anything, some kind of faith is required. One cannot be without faith, as Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita. Shadha mayo yam purusha yo yad shadha saheva sa. That every living being has some kind of faith. And one is classified according to the level of his faith. In other words, that Krishna goes on to explain there is faith in the mode of goodness, mode in the mode of passion, and in the mode of ignorance. Because Arjuna had questioned about, what, well, what if someone has faith, but is not faith in the scriptures? And then Krishna went on to explain what are different kinds of faith. But the point Krishna made is that everyone has some kind of faith. Just like someone may come up to you and say, well, I don't believe in anything. What will you say to that person? You can say, well, do you believe what you just said? <laughs> You're caught in, in, a, in, a, in a logical fallacy. If he says yes, then you believe in something. If you say no, then you also make a statement that you don't believe in anything, that you believe in something. So, uh, faith is required at some stage. Just like, even if you say uh, that, that I can hardly believe in anything, which is, it's just about logically admissible. Although, if you say, I don't believe in anything, it's not logically admissible. But if you say, I, I really don't have faith in... Well, even to speak to me, if you say, I don't believe in... I hardly believe in... Well, you have to have faith that I can understand what you mean and that each word, I, the word I, the word believe, it has a certain meaning ascribed to it, which I can understand, you can understand. You have faith that there is a process of a communication. You have faith that I'm a person who can understand what I'm saying. There, just to make a statement, I, I don't believe in hardly anything. Just to make that statement, we actually have to have so much faith in so many different things that, that, I'm, st that I'm saying something. I have a process of thinking by which I can even formulate such thoughts. When we speak, we don't think about it, but actually our whole existence is based on faith. When we, uh, just like, I asked for some water to be brought, some water is brought from there. So, although I didn't explicitly think of it at the time, when I drank this water, I had faith that there isn't science in it. Right? There might be, I don't think so, or otherwise... I'm not sure. Do we have any doctors here? If I'd have drunk water with cyanide, I probably would be uh, on the way to a post-mortem right now. So, uh, you know, I'd be making it to the newspapers tomorrow. So, uh, everything we do, we have faith. When we, when we walk on the ground, we walk along, we have faith that the, the floor in front of me won't collapse. Now, it might be that it's the flaw, you never know, it's, it's not impossible that the flaw has been designed in such a way that actually it's an optical illusion, and when I put my foot on that, it'll collapse and I'll fall through to the next level. It doesn't sound very likely, which is why you're laughing, but it's not impossible. When we, uh, when we get on a, a bus, the bus says, going to Electronic City. We have faith that actually the bus is going there. And that the driver is capable of driving. Like that. So, everything we do, there's faith. At every moment, there's some faith. Now, Arjuna is expressing faith in a, in a what to us, from our perspective, appears to be a uh, a very subtle and unverifiable principle. Now, we could say that it's a, it's 
reasonable faith to presume that the water you gave me isn't poisoned. Not directly, anyway. I mean, from, you know, if it's tap water, it's poisoned by the corporation, but that's supposed to be an acceptable level of chlorine and all this. It, it poisons you, but not as badly as the other stuff which is in the water previously. So, uh, we could say that it's a reasonable faith that by drinking this, I won't suffer from cyanide poisoning. And we could say that it's a reasonable faith that by walking along, uh, I won't, the crown won't collapse underneath me. Because faith, it's not verified, it's not empirically 100% verifiable, uh, but we can accept it by the law of averages, that mostly when people drink tap water or whatever, filtered water, that it doesn't directly poison you. So that's considered a reasonable case. Now, if we say that uh, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the support of, it, of all existence, as, as Arjuna has just stated to Krishna before this, Param Brahma Param Dhamma Pavitam Paramang Bhagavan Purusham Shashvatam Adi Deva Majam Vibhum You are the Supreme Absolute Truth, the Supreme Repose or Abode as proper translated, the, the Supreme Divine Person, uh, the Supreme Pure Person. You are the Supreme uh, Eternal Person Purusham, Shashvitam, Divyam, Adi, you are the origin of all the demigods, unborn and the greatest personality. So, like it's, well, you say, well, it's, it's reasonable to accept that this is, uh, there's water in here. Although even that, you see, I mean, some people have the philosophy that, just like the, uh, actually the Advaita Vad, their philosophy is everything is an illusion. There isn't water in this, there, this doesn't exist, you don't exist, I don't exist. Of course, there are different strains of Advaita Vedanta. They have different, they have different outlooks on everything being, on everything being nothing. But de definitely, the Nirvishishva, these Buddhists. It's funny how in Buddhism they have diff everything is nothing, but within nothingness they have different varieties of philosophy to explain how everything is nothing. There's no variety because nothing exists, but they have varieties of Buddhism, varieties of philosophy to explain how. Actually, there's no philosophy, there's nothing. It appears to be contradictory. It is. Anyway, according to Nir Visheshvad, um, I don't feel... If I think I feel thirsty, it's not even... A, according to Advaita Vad, that is an illusion. According to Buddhism or Nir Visheshvad, it's not even an illusion, because an illusion has some kind of existence. But it's, it's just nothing. It's, it's, you can't even say it's an illusion, although they do so, because they have to express it. Otherwise, they don't have any philosophy. Anyway, uh, you see, I, there's no proof that actually I feel thirsty. Maybe I'm just dreaming. Maybe I'll wake up and find that actually I'm a, I'm a spider on the wall. Uh, maybe I'll... There, there's no guarantee, you see. Look at this. What color is this? It's an easy question. Green. green. So I see this as green. You also see it as green. But how do you know what you see as green? I see it as green. Maybe you see something complete. Maybe you see some kind of color which I don't experience at all. We don't know. So what to do about that? So even what we call objective reality, Actually, if you if you dice if you take it down to its uh, to the level of observation, then actually everything's subjective. Ultimately, when we say objective, it's object. What we call objectivity is based on certain accepted axioms that we share. That's all. We accept that I see green, you see green. It's all the same. We don't know. It's a subjective. So, uh, that's actually one of the problems in, in science, that the scientists themselves admit that everything is ultimate. They're trying to explain everything objectively, but ultimately, the, ob the observer, he, uh, the observer, he interprets according to the, according to the paradigms that he has picked up through his consciousness, through his culture. In other words, ultimately, 
Although scientists are supposed to be objective, they came to the, the problem that ultimately everything is subjective. So, even though we may say that, well, this it's, we can say objectively, I can state, this is green, there's water in the tabba, and that if I drink the water, then my thirst will be slaked. Uh, ultimately, you can't prove anything. If you want to take if you want to take things down to the most basic level of no faith, but then you end up with this uh, absolutely meaningless philosophy that everything is nothing. Uh, you can't even say everything is... Uh, actually, if you're a real nirvisheshvad, you can't even say everything is nothing. If there's a va- if you say nirvisheshvad, actually there's no vad, there should be no philosophy, just nothing. Then don't breathe even. There's no need to breathe because you don't exist and there's no purpose to life. But it's a meaningless philosophy because practically we experience that we do have consciousness and that when I'm feeling thirsty and I drink water, I experience relief as, as happens, I've experienced hundreds of times in my life. So, uh, practically speaking, we feel emotions, sensual perception, seeing, touching, smelling, tasting, hearing, feeling. So, you know, you may have the philosophy that, well, everything is nothing. But I tell you, even the biggest Advaita Vadi, or everything is one, when they're hungry, they eat. They don't say, well, it's all, you know, whether I eat or I don't eat, it's all one. And when they eat, they eat rice and samba. They don't pick up some stool off the ground and eat that. <laughs> if it's all one, uh, then, you, then you eat stool. Why not? Stool and rice, it's, what's the difference? You know, it's all one, right? Stool is only rice one day later, that's all. It's just, it's just chemically processed, biologically processed, that's all. So, uh, in other words, it, you can say that, well, you know, you can't believe anything and everything's just... Uh, Everything is nothing and nothing is real, but practically it doesn't, this doesn't tally with experienced reality. It doesn't, it doesn't tally with the reality that we have, emotions, feelings. Now, one thing is that in the Mayabad philosophy, they say that all our emotions and feelings lead to suffering. Therefore, it's all illusion. Therefore, we have to, we have to say that ultimately, Everything is one, and uh, which is probably the same as saying everything is nothing. There's there's no nirvishesh. There's no vaishishta. There's no these characteristics. This is green, which is distinguished from this, which is orange. So, uh, according to nirvishesh philosophy, the the distinction between in green and orange is simply an illusion. Nothing exists. So because because they think that everything is, is so much suffering that they just want to say, no, no, just nothing exists. Hearing is painful, see, seeing is painful, touching is painful, smelling is painful. They have recognized that material existence is painful, therefore just stop it. Nothing. Nothing. Everything is nothing. Everything is nothing. Or everything is one. There's, there's not much difference between Mayavad and and Buddhist so-called philosophy. Everything is one or everything is nothing. It more or less comes to the same thing. Because in the oneness they say it's uh, it's undistinguished. Brahma. That means no roop, ras, kanda, sparsha, or shanta. They're, they're these, they don't exist. So that is actually a philosophy of hopelessness. But practically, we find everyone is trying for happiness. So the Mayavadis or or the Nirvisheshvadis, the Buddhists or the impersonalists. Buddhists, Nirvisheshvadi also mean James. They have practically the same philosophy. Or anti-philosophy, we can say. It's not actually philosophy. Um... So they say that this happiness, the quest for happiness is simply an illusion. There's a slight difference. The, 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 the 
Nirvisheshvadis, Buddhists or Jains, they are even more pessimistic. They say there's no such thing as happiness, there's no such thing as anything, nothing. Whereas the Mayavadis or Advaitavadis, it's more or less the same. It's Mayavadi is a brand of Advaitavadi. They say that, well, there is happiness, that Brahma Sukha, you just merge into the impersonal duality and just be one, Brahma Sukha. So, at least they admit the, the possibility of spiritual happiness, but their idea of happiness is just stop all activities. It's, it's also a very, stop all interactions of any kind. So that's a very negative kind of philosophy, but it's, it's, you could say it's slightly more advanced in some ways than the Buddhist philosophy. Now, the devotees, uh, Arjuna is a devotee, they have a different perspective on reality altogether. They agree with Mayavadis and impersonalists that the idea of happiness in this material world, that is an illusion. But, they don't agree that the idea of happiness per se is an illusion. Or they don't say that happiness consists of stopping all activities, all sensual interactions. Rather, they, like the impersonalists, they see that this, the, the interactions and the interrelationships of this material world are all miserable, but there is a standard of interaction. Interaction means not only between persons and objects, but particularly between persons and persons. That is on the platform of spiritual happiness, ananda chinmaya rasa. So therefore, the devotees, omtadvishno paramang padang sada pashanti suryo diviva chakshura tatam, the devotees, they are always looking to the spiritual world where there is Krishna, which is transcendental existence, happiness on the transcendental platform, ananda chinmaya rasa. This material world is the jada rasa, or the material exchange which simply results in suffering. It's, it's plain to see, but most people don't see. Pashanapina pashati. Everyone sees, but they don't see. That material life is miserable. They promote love. But love in this material world is simply a source of suffering. However, as the Vaishnava philosophers point out, that there is love or the attempt to, or the attempt to uh, experience happiness by interaction with other living beings suggests that there is real love somewhere. So that real love is for Krishna. As Krishna is explaining in Bhagavad Gita, that he is the Supreme Lord, he is the object of love. As Srila Prabhupada writes in the Krishna book, that the basic principle of Krishna consciousness is to accept that Krishna is the proper object of our love. Not that love should be stopped, but that the proper object of our love is Krishna. The materialists, they're trying to love on uh, two different platforms. The gross materialists, they're simply trying to enjoy the senses. And those who are maybe slightly more are also gross materialists, just enough. They're, they're uh, trying to enjoy love, or love, love our fellow man, altruism, humanism, all these kind of things. It's on the material platform. Then those who are the uh, beginning spiritualists or misinformed spiritualists, they say, no, no, stop all this love. Material love means simply suffering, stop it all. And those who are on the actual platform of spiritual knowledge, devotees, they say, they understand, love is meant for Krishna. So, how to understand all this? Ultimately, there has to be some faith. Arjuna here says that I accept what you are saying, Krishna. Krishna has just been speaking about love in previous verses. 
तेषां शब्दा युक्ता भजता प्रीति पूर्वक ददा बुद्धि योग I give them the intelligence by which they come to me. So we're talking about love. Now again, as soon as we talk of love, the scientific or the so-called rationalists will say, oh, stop. Don't discuss. We only want to discuss rational things. And as we know, love is blind. Love is irrational. People do so many irrational things in the name of love. So uh, it appears to be irrational, but by... Uh, Actually, in the name of science, if we say that we don't want to study things like love or emotions, and, uh, that immediately means that science is cutting itself on, uh, off from a large area of reality. Reality isn't just atoms and floating around, uh, as the physicists or well, they also say about atoms floating around. Alter. They say so many different things. But... Uh, reali- in observable reality, there... There is, uh, there are emotions and feelings. So, uh, of course, they've tried to study this through psychology and sociology and so many things. Although hardcore scientists don't consider these to be actually science, because why is that? It's very difficult to verify. Of course, as I said, even in even in uh, what they call standard science. Physics, chemistry, biology, and all their sub branches. Even within that, to verify anything, you have to accept. You have to accept certain axioms. And there are many things. There are many things which are accepted, just uh, on faith, actually, even in science. For instance, uh, who's ever seen a subatomic particle? Has anyone ever seen one? Has any scientist ever seen one? Who's ever seen? Who's ever seen a black hole in space? They accept it. I don't accept it. They they all accept it. So they accept it. Most of modern so-called scientists accept evolutionary theory. So it's accepted, and they they build up whole. Theory. They teach subjects in the university, anthropology, sociology, all based on this. So they accept so many axioms, actually on blind faith. Ultimately, uh, this evolutionary theory—it's—it's it's actually blind because there's no, there's nothing even approaching proof of it. So they accept so many axioms. Uh, so in here, you see Arjuna saying, "I accept what you say." Um, but he is accepting on what basis? Why does Arjuna believe what Krishna says? Is it simply a dogmatic or blind kind of faith? If it was, if it was simply dogmatic or blind, then why should it be couched within all this philosophy? You see here, Krishna speaking so much philosophy. Arjuna is asking very philosophical questions. Prior to this, Arjuna is asking, "Kintan Brahma kena dhyatna." King Karma Purushottama. He has very philosophical platforms. Right? What, what is the absolute truth? King Tadbrahma Kina. What is the nature of spiritual existence? What is karma? Adiyagyo to King Pokta. What is the. Who is the Lord of Sacrifice? How does he live within the. I mean, these are very philosophical questions. And Krishna explains in a very philosophical way. This is all coming in the 8th chapter, before the 10th chapter. So is it that Arjuna all of a sudden has become a driveling, slobbering sentimentalist? I just accept everything. Okay, all right, I just accept everything. Is he frustrated with Krishna? That, you know, you know, what's the use of speaking to this person? Okay, all right. Everything you say is okay. Sometimes you say to someone like that, isn't it? If someone... You know, they're just completely unreasonable and stupid. Then you say, okay, okay, whatever you say, just because they, you know, they're just such stupid people. It's, 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 as the saying goes, it's better not to argue with a fool because other people may not know the difference. You, know, you might be taken as a fool also. Or as it's also said that uh, it's better to have an intelligent enemy than a foolish friend. 
So is is Arjuna frustrated with Krishna that you know, yeah, you know I thought you were my guru, but you know, no, it's not like that at all. Rather, or is it that Arjuna is just blindly and dogmatically accepting Krishna? Doesn't seem so because Arjuna is asking very philosophical questions, and up to now it's been a very philosophical exchange. And even beyond this, you see, there's only the tenth chapter of Krishna of Bhagavad Gita, but it continues with a very deep philosophical analysis. So that that Arjuna says to Krishna, "I accept everything that you say." It doesn't appear Arjuna suddenly had a a breakdown into you know he just lost his philosophical sense and just all of a sudden for the two lines of Bhagavad Gita he had some a breakdown into foolish sentimentalism that would be inconsistent and even if he had done you see when when he when he displayed foolish sentimentalism then immediately Krishna chastised him at the, at the beginning of Bhagavad Gita. Anarya Krishnaasvargam, Akirti Karma. Why are you talking like this? Anarya, foolish rascal. Uh, what is that? Sankhya Yoga Pitam Bala Pravidanti Apastita. Pravidanti Apastita. Krishna is addressing Bala. You're just talking like a foolish child. Intelligent people don't speak like this. Nanu Shochandi Pandita. You're you're talking as if you know something, but intelligent people don't speak like this. So when Arjun spoke some babbling nonsense, Krishna immediately chastised and said, you're speaking babbling nonsense. Don't speak like that. So is it that Arjun has broken down and become a babbling nonsense vulnerable? If it's so, then then Krishna should, uh, he should reject you should tell him, now, stop. We had enough of this nonsense in the second chapter. Now we're in the tenth chapter. So you should have given up talking nonsense by now. But he didn't say. Krishna did not chastise Arjuna for saying, Sarva Meta Britangmanya Yang Mangvadi He didn't chastise. Because Arjuna established why he accepts Krishna as the Supreme Law. First of all, based on what Krishna himself has said, Valtaram Yagitapasam Sarva Loga Maheshwaram. Suhridam Sarvabhutanam Gyatama Shanti Machiti. And just before Aham Sarvasukavu, Matas Sadam Prabhatate. Matas Pratiram Nanyat Kinjidasti Dananja. Krishna himself has explained philosophically how he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Arjuna has summarized this, Param Brahma, Param Dhamma Kavitam Brahma. Then I accept all that you say. Why? Because I accept you as the Supreme Lord because all the great rishis, they also accept. On that basis, philosophical basis, what all the great authorities say. So Arjuna is giving, uh, in synopsis, he's giving reasons why he accepts Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead? Not blindly. He accepts it on the authority of great persons. He accepts on the philosophy of uh, which Krishna is speaking, which is actually the Upanishadic philosophy. Here in the purple, this verse which we read today, Prabhupada has explained, uh, he's referred to the Gita as Gita Upanishad. So Upanishad means the that part of the Vedas. Veda means knowledge. That part of the Veda which is particularly concerned with spiritual knowledge. So we find throughout the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, what he's speaking, it it parallels sections from the Upanishad. It's about the soul. The soul is never born. The soul is never dies. The soul never comes into existence. This is exactly from the Upanishad. So Krishna is speaking in the Upanishadic knowledge and bringing the uh, the knowledge of the Upanishads, he distills it all sarva Upanishad Gavo Dogda Gopala Nanaha Vatsatata Sudhir Bhokta Dugdam Gita Amrita Maha this the essence of the Upanishads is in the Bhagavad Gita which is like a compared to a cow Bhagavad Gita is compared to a cow which is the Embodiment of all the Upanishadic knowledge. 
and the uh, milking, taking the milk out of it. It's Krishna. Taking out of all the Upanishads, he's taking the milk. This is the Bhagavad Gita. Then the calf, who, who, to get the milk to come, you have to bring the calf. So Arjuna is like a calf. And the Sudhya, those who are very uh, self-controlled, they are the enjoyers of it. It means Arjuna, the calf, takes first, and then after others take the milk. So those who are very self-controlled, they can understand the subject matter of Bhagavad Gita. And what is that subject matter? Dugdam Gita Mritamma. The, the, the milk is the message of Bhagavad Gita. So it's poetic language to describe what is the nature of a Bhagavad Gita is the essence of all the Upanishads. That is the, this is the essence of the knowledge of the Vedas. So, and the knowledge of the Vedas, uh, that is described uh, also previously to how Krishna is expanded by great rishis. Uh, that great rishis and demigods. Yam Brahma Varanindra Ruja Marata Stundanti Divya Istavai Vedai Sangha Kamapanishad Gayanti Yam Samagaha All the great demigods, they glorify Krishna. All the Vedas and the Upanishads, they glorify Krishna. So um, Arjuna is accepting Krishna's supremacy on the basis of Vedic knowledge. Uh, not simply what the Vedas state, but the Vedas, they're also very subtle to understand so how the Vedas are described by great demigods and acharyas. And, uh, on, and also another important factor in understanding is our own faith and acceptance. Just like I'm saying, everything ultimately comes, ultimately people say, well, we shouldn't have blind faith. But ultimately, everything is accepted on faith. Faith shouldn't be blind. Arjuna, his faith is based on Shastra, Sadhu, and on his own personal realization of Krishna. Krishna is standing before him. He has a realization. Krishna is the Supreme Lord. That realization is verified by Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra. In this case, his Guru is Krishna himself. So everything ultimately rests on faith. That... Uh, you see, there's water. I can I can send it for analysis and everything. But is it pure water? Am I going to get poisoned or not? But then I have to have faith in the scientists who analyze it. I have to have faith that they haven't made a conspiracy with all of you to poison me. And sorry, I know you don't want to poison me. I'm just saying that. So, uh, and I have to have faith that their that their method of analysis is also. Uh, Correct. It's a, it's a good point. And, uh, you know, but by that time, I might have, you know, by the time they do all that, I might have died of, you know, dehydration. <laughs> so, and if every step I make, I have to, uh, you know, bring a soil analyst and an engineer and see if it's hard enough and and I have to have a doctor to analyze my legs to see if my muscles are still at every step in working order. It's in practice. We have, we have to have faith. So, if we are to go to higher levels of consciousness, then we're going to have, just like we, we have faith, I have faith that when you give me this water, it's done in, in with good intention, and that if I take it, it'll be okay. So if we are to go to levels of higher consciousness beyond eating, sleeping, mating, defending, watching television, reading the newspaper, working like an ass, and dying, and that's our whole life, then we have to have faith that there are, there is a method to attain that higher level of consciousness, and there are people who can help us. We have to have some faith. Some faith is required. First of all, you have to have faith that there is a level of higher consciousness. If we think, 
If we think that the whole world is just, the whole of reality is I got born, I work hard, I party hard, and I die, I fall down on the ground hard, flat, bang, and uh, that's it, finished. So if that's our faith, then that will be our whole life. And we live like an animal, die like an animal, and take birth as an animal. We may not believe that, but others may not believe it, but we believe it on good authority. So if we are to accept uh, that there is a platform beyond this, eat, sleep, drink, be so-called merry, and be so-called enjoy, and simply die, then we have to have faith in a higher principle. Uh, that shouldn't be blind faith, otherwise you see people run up to Sai Baba and they feel they have some experience. Oh, I saw Baba. Oh, they have some experience. But it's based... They may be having some experience. And see, I saw the ashes coming out of the picture. To them, that verifies that he's God. Even though they don't have a clear idea of what it means to be God. But that is blind faith because it's not based on the criteria for what it means to be God. There are certain criteria. People think, well, God means whatever you want it to mean, but that's that's ridiculous. A what, just like every, every word has some some particular phenomenon phenomenon related with it. Just like if I say this is a watch, you could say, well, that's your opinion. I think it's an apple. So you can say like that. But that's ridiculous. Everything is defined. Even, it's not that God is so vague that you can just define it according to your own way of thinking. God is a particular principle who, although he's unlimited, he's also definable. Even to say unlimited is to give some kind of definition that distinguishes from limited. So people say God is, even if you say, some people say God is indefinable. By saying God is indefinable, immediately you're putting some kind of definition. So Krishna consciousness, although this lecture may appear to be like going round and round in funny kind of like a maze or something but actually the, I'm just making the point to that when Arjuna says I believe everything that you say is not based on blind faith but it's it's based on um, a faith that has very good premises and which is ultimately verifiable to our experience, if we follow the process of bhakti yoga, then we can all also experience the presence of Krishna in our lives. And there are many persons who have done that. Vita Raga Bhaya Kodha Anmaya Mama Prashitaha Bahavo Nyana Tapasa Bhuta Madhavagataha. Many, many persons in the past, Krishna said, becoming free from uh, anger, attachment, and fear became purified by cultivating knowledge of me and austerity, and in this way they came to me. So, it's not that Krishna consciousness is something that is uh, so subtle and so indefinable that it's beyond our grasp, but rather we see that there are many persons who are develop the Krishna consciousness according to the description in Shastra. We saw Prabhupada, we saw how he lived, we know how he lived. There are many great persons. Madhvacharya is very famous in this area. Sri Padraman Ujacharya also. So, um, the gross materialists or the persons without faith in God, such as Advaita Gaudis, they would say that Madhvacharya, Ramanujacharya, Prabhupada, all these great acharyas, what they spoke and what what they appeared to be experiencing, the tremendous devotion to God, which gave them so much motivation and power, that was all simply illusion. So we have ultimately we have to accept that either what Krishna says and what the great acharya says is an illusion, and they are all wrong. Or we have to accept that those who don't accept Krishna are all wrong. Everyone, some people say all the philosophies are the same. Well, that's impossible because many philosophies are diametrically opposed. Vaishnavs say that Krishna is the supreme absolute truth. The Mayavadis say that 
No, the Krishna, the form of Krishna is not the supreme person of So you can't say it's all the same. There are differences. So if you say, well, I don't accept any philosophy, then you accept the philosophy that you don't accept any philosophy. You accept what you yourself think. So, how much can we know by ourselves? Better to follow those who appear to be on a platform of higher consciousness, if we want to go to ourselves to a platform of higher consciousness. In everything we have to follow. We, if you want to get trained even how to pass school, you have to, at a young age you get trained how to wipe your backside, how to pass in school, and what to speak of you. You want to get trained as an engineer or a doctor. You have to accept some authority. If you're taking, now we're going to study how to do surgery and how to uh, do a hernia operation. So the surgeon comes and says, you say, yeah, no, and why should I follow you? I'll do it my own way. And then you won't be allowed to practice as a doctor. You have to accept an authority. You can't do it your own way. And there's a particular way to do it. You have to do it that way. If you think, well, you know, I'll just get a hammer and smash on the groin and that will work and that will, that will cure the hernia. It's not going to cure the hernia. It's a, you to, such a delicate thing you have to cut in exactly the right way, do the right way. So, it's, uh, the point I'm making here is that Arjuna, he says, I said everything that you said. He's not blind. He's very reasonable. That's all. That's just the one point I'm going to make in his life. Are there any questions? Yeah. Mm. Does faith enter the stage of realization? Um, Yes, but faith is because... You see, all these stages, they're included within Baba and Prima. So, at the stage of faith, one has faith in the, in the attainment of Baba and Prima. One has faith in that there is Krishna, and I have my relationship with him. So, at the stage of Baba and Prima, the faith becomes so natural and is not based on this kind of discussion. Just like I was giving that example of drinking water, that we don't, you could take it to a, a water, a chemical analysis, but we have a simple thing. We don't even think, do I have faith with the waters? It's just, a, it's, for us it's a common everyday thing to drink some water. It's, in other words, faith is there, but it's, in, it's so much internalized that uh, it's, we don't even recognize it. So in the same way, for pure devotees of Krishna, their experience of Krishna is so direct and intense that for them there's no real question of, of do I have to philosophically analyze and have faith. It, their faith is based on direct experience. So faith is present but not in the same way. It becomes subordinate to, it, to direct experience. There's no need for, for philosophical sense of faith for one who's 